Welcome everyone. Our first speaker today is gonna to be Dr. Patricia Jones. Dr. Patricia Jones attended her undergraduate training at Johns Hopkins University, receiving dual degrees in chemistry and Spanish prior to obtaining her MD from Albany Medical College where she graduated magna cum laude. She then went on to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill where she completed internal medicine and pediatrics training, gastroenterology fellowship and advanced fellowship training in transplant hepatology. In addition to this, she has her Master of Science in Clinical Research from UNC Chapel Hill. She holds four board certifications and is currently an assistant professor here at University of Miami. She has multiple funded research projects, including work with hepatocellular carcinoma and examining racial and socioeconomic health disparities in our diverse South Florida population. She has also been invited to speak on these topics multiple times at a national level. Dr. Jones, you can get started whenever you would like. Thank you so much. Um, give me one second to just start the slideshow. So hopefully everyone can see my slides clearly. We're gonna be talking about immune mediated hepatotoxicity. Um, I have some disclosures listed here on uh, this slide. Uh, none of them are related to the topic, but I do serve on an advisory committee for the Hepatitis B Foundation as well as the AGA. So at the end of today's lecture, my hope is that everyone will understand and explain the current screening recommendations for hepatocellular carcinoma, as well as gain familiarity with the breadth of oncologic conditions that are treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors and understand treatment approaches to hepatotoxicity from immune checkpoint inhibitors. I'm gonna start with the case presentation. In 2018, we had a 62-year-old male patient who presented with right upper quadrant pain as well as right shoulder pain. And imaging revealed that he had a cirrhotic appearing liver with nodular contours and stigmata of portal hypertension, including splenic varices. He was noted to have an exophytic heterogeneous peripherally enhancing lesion, which was about five by 5.3 centimeters that demonstrated washout on delayed imaging and was highly suspicious for HCC. He also had a small linear irregularity that was noted to extend from the lesion to the diaphragm and an adjacent satellite lesion that measured up to 0.9 centimeters. His alpha fetal protein was significantly elevated at 340.9. So we staged his cancer according to the Barcelona Clinic liver cancer staging system. He was stage B, which is intermediate. And we were concerned about the possibility of extra hepatic extension, which would have caused him to be upstaged. In terms of risk factors for cirrhosis, this patient had prediabetes, obesity, and hyperlipidemia. So we're talking the first about our first objective. Cirrhosis is the strongest risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma. 85 to 95% of people with HCC have cirrhosis, and the risk of developing HCC ranges from 1% to 8% each year. The 5% uh, the five-year cumulative risk is 5 to 30% and depends on the etiology of liver disease, the region, the ethnicity, and the stage of cirrhosis. And the highest risk of HCC is among those patients with decompensated cirrhosis. So we're th we think that cirrhosis progresses to HCC along a dysplastic pathway. In cirrhosis, you have regenerative nodules, and those can progress and develop some alterations to become low-grade dysplastic nodules, and finally, high-grade dysplastic nodules. One of the earliest alterations that are not noted are mutations in the TERP promoter, but as additional somatic mutations um, are accumulated, patients develop early HCC and then progressive HCC, uh, and can develop portal thrombosis and even metastases. Screening is recommended uh, for patients at high risk to develop HCC. Uh, since 1967, the Liver Cancer Study Group of Japan has actually maintained a nationwide prospective registry of all patients with HCC. And you can see here in the first table that back in the 1970s, um, the maximum tumor size at the time of initial detection in 65% of patients was greater than 10.1. Uh, but since the 1990s, they implemented strategies that educate patients and physicians about the risk of HCC. And the other thing that's important is that screening is supported financially. And you can see that in the last study period, uh, 2001 to 2005, only 6.5% had a tumor greater than 10.1 uh, centimeters in size. And so recommended screening is with ultrasound with or without alpha fetal protein, and that's recommended by both the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, as well as the European Association for the Study of the Liver. 
um, and that's what's cost effective. There are certain circumstances such as a patient who's obese or has a heterogeneous liver or ascites. And in those situations, sometimes CT scan or MRI is preferred. You notice that once these uh, recommendations were implemented, there was a significant improvement in five-year overall survival rates from 3.7% in the earlier period to 42.7% in the final period. And the difference between each preceding uh, period was statistically significant. And similarly, there was an increase in median survival. So this is our patient's treatment timeline. Shortly after diagnosis, he received transarterial chemoembolization. The patient was uninsured initially and was lost to follow-up because his follow-up visit was canceled. Um, and he assumed that if no one reached out to him, then no news was good news. But he had actually enrolled in one of my research studies and one of my coordinators called him and he said he didn't have any visits. He assumed things were going well. And subsequently he was able to get uh, Medicaid and we saw him uh, again. He uh, ended up getting another taste or transarterial chemoembolization in June of 2019, but unfortunately his disease had progressed past uh, the point that he could be considered for transplant. That uh, little area in the diaphragm was more concerning, and so he received systemic therapy with linvatinib starting September 2019 and then cabozantinib in July of 2020. And at that time, his alpha fetal protein exceeded 1,300. He continued to develop progressive disease, and in August 2020, his imaging was notable for extensive extracapsular infiltration to the right diaphragm, the inferior vena cava, the right adrenal and superior perirenal fat, and he developed as well innumerable amount of metastatic lesions in the lungs, and he had an interval increase in mediastinal and portal hepatis lymphadenopathy. So the patient was starting to lose hope, and he sought a second opinion. And I want to take this opportunity to talk about sort of the most recently approved therapy, which is combination therapy with atezolizumab and bevacizumab. This was approved by the FDA uh, less than a year ago in May 2020. Atezolizumab selectively targets PDL1 and bevacizumab targets VEGF. So we have the I'm Brave 150 study, which was a global multi centered open label phase three randomized trial which randomized 336 patients to the atezolizumab bevacizumab arm and 165 to the serafinib arm, which had been the standard of care for many years. 18 patients uh, in the atezolizumab bevacizumab arm had complete response compared to no patients in the serafinib arm. And median survival was longer as well in those treated with atezolizumab and bevacizumab. It was also associated with higher quality of life. Notably, there were no significant differences in grade three to five adverse events. So this uh, is from the, the seminal paper from the New England Journal, and this just shows a significant improved overall and progression-free survival in those treated with atezolizumab, bevacizumab compared to serafinib. In terms of survival and safety, everybody who was in the study had, was either child QA, so very well compensated disease or ECOG performance status of zero or one. And I've highlighted the liver enzymes since we're going to be talking about hepatotoxicity. You note that um, there wasn't a significant difference in terms of any grade um, elevated AST 19.5% compared to 16.7% in the serafinib group or ALT, which was 14% in the atezolizumab bevacizumab group compared to 9% in the serafinib group. Um, you'll note though, numerically, for grade three or four events, it was numerically higher, but not statistically significant in the tezolizumab, bevacizumab arm for AST and ALT, but for bilirubin, it was actually higher in the serafinib group. So by August of 2020, just in two months, his alpha fetal protein had gone from 1,300 to exceeding 60,500, which is the upper limits of normal on our assay here at UM. Uh, in September 2020, he began treatment with the tezolizumab and bevacizumab, and in October 2020, he had bland embolization. He was getting care um, externally except for his hepatology care at this point. So after about four months or six cycles, his liver enzymes uh, began to increase. And so it's always difficult with this population of patients because their enzymes often are not normal. So I would say October was sort of his normal or his baseline. And you can see that he does have elevated AST and total bilirubin at baseline. Um, and his alpha fetal protein, this is one month after starting therapy, had gone down to 21,000 um, significantly. But you can see that in January, his bilirubin increased significantly. And this is when his oncologist started dexamethasone out of concern for immune-mediated hepatotoxicity. Uh, initially, he had some improvement. You can see how uh, much his AFP had decreased by that point. 
So he had improvement of his bilirubin, but then as they started to taper the dexamethasone, his AST and ALT increased. We got a recent CT scan out of concern that this might be progression of liver cancer. And it showed that there was actually progression of metastatic disease in the lymph nodes and the adrenal glands, but not in the liver. As the bilirubin started to go back up, we decided to start mycophenolate mofetil. And you can see that his alpha fetoprotein just continues to climb as he has not been in, on any therapy since January of uh, 2021. So I wanna talk about the mechanism and the types of immune checkpoint inhibitors because not everyone really uses these medications or is exposed to these. And I thought this was a good opportunity um, to do so because I've had at least three patients in the last three months that have had this entity. And I wanted to make sure that we all understand um, it clearly. So the mechanism of action of the checkpoint inhibitors is, is a little different for both, but really CTLA-4 um, is uh, or program death ligand or uh, program death receptor, they require binding for activation of T cells. And when you use inhibitors of CTLA-4 or PD-1 or, or PD-1, you can interrupt this, which allows the T cell that to then approach the tumor and leads to tumor cell death. So here we have uh, the, the schematic for CTLA-4 and on the bottom, we have the schematic for PD-1 and PD-L1. PD-L1 is on the tumor cells and PD-1 are on lymphocytes, but inhibiting this essentially allows the T cell to then target the tumor cell um, and leads to death. And on the right, I have this uh, schematic which shows all of the FDA approved immune checkpoint inhibitors and all of the various entities. And so the, the takeaway is that it's used very widely, squamous cell, head and neck cancer, melanoma, we've already talked about hepatocellular cellular carcinoma, triple negative breast cancer. I just got an alert last week about a New England Journal article where it's going to be used um, adjuvant in patients who've had resection for esophageal or GE junction cancer. So it's very widely used. Immune mediated hepatotoxicity is, is actually pretty common. And the mechanism is that immune checkpoint inhibitors lead to increased immune activation. And the side effects can mimic autoimmune conditions and are termed immune related adverse events. The organs that are most commonly affected are the skin, liver, GI tract, and endocrine glands. So like I mentioned, it's common and immune mediated hepatotoxicity can occur in up to 16% of patients who are receiving immune checkpoint inhibitors. It's caused by increased immune response. And this is very different from conventional drug-induced liver injury or DILI, which is caused by direct hepatotoxicity as we see this in Tylenol or is idiosyncratic in the case of antibiotics such as amoxicillin clavulanic acid or nitrofurantoin. We typically grade uh, the severity of hepatotoxicity using the common terminology uh, criteria for adverse events. And you can see that uh, grade one is mild and AST, ALT are less than three times the upper limits of normal. Alkaline phosphatase and GGT are less than 2.5 times the upper limits of normal. And total bilirubin is less than 1.5 times the upper limits of normal. And you can compare that to grade four where AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase and GGT are more than 20 times the upper limits of normal and total bilirubin is uh, greater than 10 times. Uh, grade five is fatal hepatotoxicity. So the incidence of uh, immune-mediated hepatotoxicity varies widely from 0.7% to 16%, and it depends on the type of immune checkpoint inhibitor, as well as patients are receiving monotherapy versus combination therapies. So it's been reported uh, in a systematic review, uh, the PD-1 inhibitors, uh, so 0.7 to 2.1%, and so common examples of those are nivolumab or pembrolizumab. The PD-L1 inhibitors, or standard dose CTLA-4, it ranges more from 0.9% to 12.4%. Combined CTLA-4 inhibitor, an example of that would be ipilimumab and PD-1, it ranges actually from about 7 to 13%, and then high-dose CTLA-4 inhibitors is 16%. So what are the risk factors? Uh, it includes prior autoimmune disease, and that's been seen in the CTLA-4 inhibitors, but also patients who've had prior immune-related adverse events, is, even if it's from a different class of agent, and the risk may be dose-dependent. Specifically, we've seen that with the anti-CTLA-4 inhibitor, ipilimumab. Using combined immune checkpoint inhibitors increases the risk of immune-mediated hepatotoxicity. When does it happen? A median five to 13 weeks, but the range can be from one to 207 weeks, and it may be shorter for the anti-CTLA-4 uh, inhibitors versus the anti-PD-1 or PD-L1s. 
how do patients present? Oftentimes they're asymptomatic. So at a minimum, patients are getting blood drawn um, basically before each cycle, sometimes more often. And so oftentimes it's picked up on routine blood work. Uh, some patients may have fever. Some uh, rarely have acute liver failure. So 0.1 to 0.2% of the time. And in approximately half of patients, they will have other non-hepatic immune-related adverse events, including pneumonitis, hypothesitis, hyperthyroidism, bronchitis, myositis, myocarditis, or pancreatitis. And so it really spans the breadth of internal medicine. Initially, the pattern is that it's a sort of a missed cholestatic picture and hepatocellular, meaning AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase can be elevated. But at its peak, um, it's predominantly hepatocellular. So it's important that we all realize that immune-mediated hepatotoxicity is a diagnosis of exclusion. We have to systematically exclude other causes, including viral infections, alcohol-related liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, liver metastases, sepsis, ischemic hepatitis, decompensated cirrhosis, and autoimmune hepatitis. And I've bolded liver metastases um, and decompensated cirrhosis because that's generally, especially in a patient with hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, something that we consider whether or not this is just their liver disease uh, progressing since the majority do have cirrhosis. But also those who don't have known liver disease but do have diffuse metastases will often have a picture of uh, liver dysfunction as their uh, liver becomes replaced with tumor. So this is not autoimmune hepatitis in the classic sense. There are some key differences. Autoimmune hepatitis is female predominant and the autoantibodies, anti-nuclear antibodies and anti-smooth muscle antibody are, are often positive. Whereas in checkpoint inhibitor, there's no gender predilection and uh, autoantibodies may be positive. If they are, they're very low titer. Uh, on biopsy, both will have uh, lobular inflammation, while autoimmune hepatitis will have plasma cytosis, and this is not typically seen in immune-mediated hepatitis, and I'll show that a little later. So this algorithm is pretty busy, but I actually think it's very helpful, um, and, and it gives us a, sort of a, a process by which to walk through when we have a patient with elevated liver enzymes. So again, patients are getting enzymes checked before each administration of immune checkpoint inhibitor. If they have abnormal liver enzymes or they're symptomatic, you will evaluate for other non-hepatic immune related adverse events. And the treatment is dictated by the organ system that's most severely affected. But we wanna rule out any other causes of hepatotoxicity as mentioned. Once we suspect checkpoint inhibitor uh, induced hepatotoxicity, if it's grade one or mild, you can actually continue the immune checkpoint inhibitor, but you'll be checking the liver enzymes pretty frequently. There's no need for immunosuppression. If it's grade two, three, or four, you might consider a liver biopsy, which we'll talk about, but you do have to hold the immune checkpoint inhibitor. In terms of when you get liver enzymes, it depends on the severity. Something that's less severe, you might be able to get uh, every three days, where typically if we're dealing with someone who has grade four, they may be admitted to the hospital and we're getting enzymes at least daily. Um, and in terms of treatment, grade two, you don't have to start immunosuppression, but grade three and four, you do. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. So steroids are typically started and then tapered over four to six weeks, but the dose can be re-escalated as needed. Some patients may improve without corticosteroids, especially grade three, but grade two, but even grade three. So I typically use uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology or the ASCO clinical practice guidelines, which state that grade three should receive one to two milligrams a kilo per day of methylprednisolone equivalents. The algorithm that I just uh, showed previously was from a systematic review, and they actually start at a lower dose. Uh, so if you choose one milligram per kilo per day, you'd be practicing according to both of those recommendations. Grade four should receive two milligrams per kilo per day of methylprednisolone equivalents according to the ASCO um, guidelines. The other systematic review suggests one to two milligrams per kilo per day. And the reason that the systematic review uh, suggests a lower amount is you know, for the same principle, we should use the least amount of medication necessary because of the potential consequences of use of steroids. So we know that steroid use is associated with infection and it's associated with a 7.7 fold increased risk of serious infections in patients treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. It is really important that we respond quickly. 
Uh, alternative immunosuppression is needed for steroid non-responders. So if there's no response to steroids within three to five days, we have to start additional therapy. And the most commonly used agent is mycophenolate mofetil, but I've listed some other agents, including azathioprine, cyclosporin, tacrolimus. I have infliximab with an asterisk, and that's because in all the guidelines, it says the use is discouraged, given the risk of idiosyncratic drug-induced liver injury, which occurs in about one out of 120 cases, but has not been shown uh, in patients that have immune checkpoint um, related hepatotoxicity, probably because it hasn't been used. So we can't really say much about these other agents. So should we biopsy and when? We should consider liver biopsy in grades two to four because it helps in patients who are non-responders. It helps us to um, establish the extent of the damage and to exclude other causes and to confirm the diagnosis. So you will see lobular hepatitis with numerous histiocytes. You will see endotheliolitis, which is something that is described within uh, transplant rejection, actually. You'll see loose or well-formed granulomas, a fibrin ring granuloma, various degrees of inflammation. You may see cholangitis or cholangiolitis. And steatosis is described, but um, of course, this is so prevalent, it's hard to know that it's related to the immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so everyone knows the largest sample only includes 60 patients, so we don't biopsy often enough to really understand it. We do have these biopsies, and these photos were provided courtesy of Dr. Ronquillo from the Department of Pathology. We had a recent patient that actually had biopsy to do next generation sequencing for melanoma, but on the same day happened to have a flare um, and was noted to have immune-mediated hepatotoxicity. And what you see in pretty much all of these are granulomas. You see panlobular hepatitis, but you see microgranulomas and acidophil bodies in each of the panels. Um, you see a lipid vacuole with some histiocytes um, as well. So you see a fibrin ring granuloma. When do you resume? It's a case-by-case -case basis. Once the enzymes uh, improve to grade one, you can consider resuming. Some will co-administer with immunosuppression. Some will switch agents. In 107 patients with grade three, 31 patients were rechallenged. Those who were rechallenged were younger, had fewer non-hepatitis immune-related adverse events, had milder disease, and were less likely to have steroid refractory hepatitis. Six of those who were uh, rechallenged developed an immune-related adverse events that required discontinuation, and four of those six actually developed recurrent immune-mediated hepatotoxicity. Most cases will resolve after treatment. Uh, with immunosuppression. It usually happens within five to nine weeks. Most are given steroids and resolution occurs in about 98% of these cases, but the half-life of these uh, medications vary. And so this impacts timing to resolution. Uh, the death rate has been reported at 0.04%. Most of those have come from patients treated with anti-CTLA-4 inhibitors, but I think um, historically that's been in use longest uh, and sort of at higher dose. So we've learned a lot from that agent as well. It's important that we all remember that due to the presence of advanced underlying malignancy, liver transplant is generally not an option if these patients develop liver failure. So that's another reason why time is of the essence. This is uh, just to quickly show, we had uh, 40 patients with our initial experience with HCC who were treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. The majority got pembrolizumab as part of a clinical trial, 28 of them. And you notice that um, therapy had to be stopped uh, due to elevated liver enzymes in 25%, and steroids were used in 55% of them. And we're doing another study to not just look at patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, but to also look at um, patients treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors, period. And so we used the data from uh, Slicer Dicer and then got a formal request from the uh, Bioinformatics and Data Warehouse. And we found that since January 1st, 2019, over about a two year period, we have 1600 patients that have been treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, and 1,134 have abnormal enzymes. So using the ASCO definitions, we categorize them into grades and we're going to be doing a, a formal chart review to really understand more about what this looks like, what predicts development of uh, severe immune mediated hepatotoxicity. And also I think more importantly, what are our patterns of management? Um, so I'm really grateful to have two medical students and two internal medicine residents helping me with this project. So the take home points are that all patients with cirrhosis should be screened for hepatocellular carcinoma with ultrasound with or without alpha fetoprotein. And as I mentioned, CT and MRI can be used in special situations. Uh, immune mediated hepatitis is a common occurrence in patients treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. 
Um, and in those who do not respond to corticosteroids, there's really a very short window to begin other immunosuppressants. So optimal care and outcomes require a well-coordinated co multidisciplinary approach. So take any questions and I have some helpful references. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for that really informative and well-presented uh, study. And I think it's very exciting, the, the, the stuff that you're doing. Um, in your slicer dicer, were you able to subtract the individuals that had abnormal LFTs at the beginning of the study? And yeah, so, so slicer dicer, it really, I used it just to get the number of patients with um, who were treated immune checkpoint inhibitors. And then I worked with Alfredo, who was really helpful, and he was able to at least give me the peak at yeah. different periods of time. The other thing that I did is I gave him ICD-10 codes for chronic liver disease. So I didn't mention that, um, but only about 4% of patients had an ICD-10 for cirrhosis. Um, and we know coding's kind of terrible, so that's why chart review is really necessary. Um, but he was able to give me at least three different time points before uh, that study period, during the study period, and after, so we could identify. So those people who had normal enzymes, they had normal enzymes that entire time. It may be that some who have abnormal, as we do the chart review, there's an, another explanation, and that's why we need to do it. Um, but yeah, he was very, very helpful. Yeah, you might want to also add orchitis to your list of uh, complications of these immune checkpoint inhibitors. It's a recently newly I described. I will write that down. <laughs> Sounds painful. Uh, yeah. Um, Anyway, I, I, Dr. Mera has a question in the uh, chat. Would you like to read your, unmute yourself and read it? Okay. Well, the question is that, um, have we observed these patients getting worse and how do you prevent the cancer from getting worse? Uh, yes, we've observed them getting worse, um, but I don't think that there's much that we can do. And most of the patients that are gonna be treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors have very advanced disease. And I think that's probably the case for most malignancies. They typically have uh, you know, stage three or BCLCC in, in our case. Um, and so we do as much as we can to try to get patients to a point where we can restart therapy. But unfortunately, sometimes we are unable to. Uh, so this particular patient that I discussed, he has not been restarted and we've, um, coordinated hospice and palliative care um, for this particular person. Um, Thank you. Dr. Levy, can you unmute yourself? Sure. Thank you, Patricia. Great talk. My question is um, a very practical one when we're managing these patients. There's always this question of what is the response that we expect to see in the first three to five days before we start methotrexate? Oh, I'm sorry, mycophenolate. Mm-hmm. So can you define, is that a percent reduction? Is there any <laughs> evidence out there? That no, <laughs> that's a great question. And I don't think it's well-defined. Um, I think it's probably defined by from person to person and that's a problem. Um, so it's not very clear. Certainly, you know what non-response looks like. Um, but I think that, uh, no, I could not find anything where, you know, a 10% reduction or what have you. Uh, so maybe that's something we can work on. Exactly. Maybe your study will be able to help us define this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for an excellent grand rounds. Dr. Corbett, can you introduce our next speaker? Of course. Our next speaker is Dr. Elaine Tozman. Dr. Tozman attended undergraduate and medical school at University of Toronto before attending residency training at Wellesley Hospital in Toronto, and then rheumatology fellowship, where she served as chief fellow and completed further years as a research fellow at McMaster University Medical Center. She then came to the University of Miami where she has over 35 years of experience and is currently an associate professor of medicine. Her research interests have included broad areas of rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, lupus in males, and more recently, granulomatosis mastitis. Dr. Toastman? Thank you, thank you very much. Is that now evident? No, we, we don't see your slides yet, Dr. Tozman. All right. Um, let's see. 
Is that now available? No, we, we still Share don't see them. Now we're good there. Just hit slideshow and we're good to go. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, th this topic today is granulomatous mastitis, a disease which many of you likely have not heard about yet. Um, how does a rheumatologist develop an interest in this? Um, the way this sequence developed um, as you might imagine, several of our patients um, are sent to us because of our interest in immunosuppressive therapy and our experience with it. Um, we started to see patients in clinic and otherwise with granulomatous mastitis who were sent to us specifically for immunosuppressive therapy. Um, it was surprising to see that the rheumatology literature, in fact, described medical treatment for granulomatous mastitis. We started to see more patients with this disease. And then I did an extensive review of the current literature and thought, oh, well, this is going to be pretty straightforward and I'll know exactly what to do and how to better evaluate these patients. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite a straight line. Um, I have, and you will have lots of questions regarding this disease and we only have some answers. So it wasn't quite a direct route to go from looking at the disease uh, in the literature and then de developing a way in which we could evaluate an individual patient. Some of the questions that I had about granulomatous mastitis are listed on this slide. You can appreciate that history should be fairly straightforward. Even epidemiology, which I thought was going to be quite straightforward is not. Uh, diagnosis and differential diagnosis I can share with you, um, as well as the biopsy uh, details. How we use radiology for these individual patients is somewhat straightforward. Etiology is certainly anything but no known at this time. And for the treatment, both surgical and medical, um, we do not have a standardized protocol. So we'll start with the history of this disease. Granulomas mastitis was first described in five patients by pathologists Kessler and Wallach in 1972. These patients were characterized by having granulomas and abscess formation. Um, and clinically, uh, before the bi biopsies were performed, these patients were thought to have malignant tumors. The type of lesion appears to be a well-defined entity. So you would think from there on, we could identify a larger group of patients and come to some understanding of how to treat them. Why I think you need to learn about granulomatous mastitis, although it is a rare inflammatory disease, it involves the lobules and ducts with granulomatous changes. It's a very difficult disease to manage due to clinical similarity to breast cancer, not only si similar clinical findings, but similar radiographic findings, um, the patients need to be adequately diagnosed because they have often recurrence uh, of their disease and lack of defined or medical and surgical treatments. You need to know uh, at least the best course of therapy for these patients and which specialists might be interested in this disease. Well, those who do breast surgery, certainly, but this has been described in the dermatology literature, gynecology literature, infectious disease papers, internal medicine, oncology, pathology, radiology, rheumatology, and probably more that I haven't included here. In terms of epidemiology, this is quite a rare disease. It really depends where in the world you see patients and the actual um, incidence of disease. It's estimated um, based on data, as you see from 2009, that 2.4 per 100,000 women or 0.03% uh, 
um, would have this diagnosis. This is based on um, morbidity and mortality weekly report in 2009 in United States. However, the majority of publications, especially larger series, have originated from the Middle East, from Mediterranean countries, and from Asia, which means that um, in some areas of the world, it's not diagnosed very often, and um, it, there is a higher prevalence among women who are of Asian, Hispanic, and Middle Eastern origin. The true incidence is unknown. If we look at a distribution of papers of granulomatous mastitis from different countries, you can appreciate a, a couple of things. Although it has been well described in the United States, um, this is often related to um, retrospective series or combinations of series rather than individual sites where this has been diagnosed. Um, although we see that Mexico has had some publication, um, it's surprising that in the uh, South American uh, population, we haven't seen it at least within any of the PubMed literature that has been translated into English as well. You can appreciate several in the Mediterranean area and in the Middle East area, um, as well as the Far East and, and China. So although this is a nice way to look at um, potential patients, I think because we have a very transient population and we have a, um, a population of patients who are Hispanic, it's likely that we'll be able to um, get a good number of patients for um, evaluation and for treatment. These are data from a table um, showing numbers of cases from different parts of the world. I think what you need to appreciate is if you are in a rather um, uniform population um, in the um, northern European areas, for example, you're unlikely to see many patients with this disease. If, however, you have a number of patients who are Hispanic or from Mediterranean countries, um, the Middle East, um, you're liable to see many more patients with this diagnosis. And that leads us to think that um, we could certainly uh, co-partner with other parts of the world to try to evaluate patients with this disease as well, not only in a retrospective way, but in a prospective way to look at these patients. If we look at the United States epidemiology, these are data from Mayo Clinic, which were pre presented in 2018. And it's quite, quite surprising. They looked at uh, approximately 17,000 breast biopsies over 17 years, and they had um, only 20 patients with granulomatous mastitis. Um, this is a listing of the various uh, granulomatous diseases that the patients had on breast biopsy. And you can see that one third had silicone granulomas, 30% um, had fat necrosis, and only 16% had granulomatous mastitis. I think this is a very select population in whom they are uh, Midwestern uh, population largely or a um, non-Hispanic population. Um, and that is a way that you can interpret that and say that it's likely much more common in other areas of the country. If we look at series from the United States, I've listed on this slide two um, papers that have been uh, reported from Houston, one in 2013 and the second in 2018. The characteristics of the patients are listed uh, in a table format on the right side, side of the slide. And what I'd like you to take away from this is that although it is largely a female population, um, three of the 90 patients were actually male and 90% were Hispanic. That really means that we should be able to see um, quite a number of patients in the, excuse me, in the South Florida area. Um, it often was a diagnosis made within one to five years after pregnancy, and patients were obese with a BMI of greater than 30 in half of the patients. Although other characteristics were evaluated, including uh, smoking history, uh, hormonal use, 
um, this did not seem to be as important a feature of these patients with this disease. Uh, in terms of presentation, this can occur either in a single breast or in both breasts. Um, it is more likely to occur in a single breast and the initial complaint is the patient will feel pain in the breast or a mass in the breast. It is often associated with erythema over the overlying skin and surprisingly about a third of the patients will have nipple discharge. I always thought of this as a particularly worrisome sign. In addition, about 5% of the patients will have fistulas develop with drainage from this tender, um, painful mass to the surface of the skin, which makes us think about either uh, a terrible cancer or a terrible infection. And you can appreciate on this table in terms of clinical presentation, um, most of the patients, more than 80% had mass and tenderness as, as a typical association. I'll go over um, treatment a little later in the talk. If we look at the anatomy, you can be reminded that there is inflammation of the um, breast ductal nodular unit. And this is a really pretty picture, not necessarily for the patient, but for the clinician to evaluate a patient who has actual erythema over the surrounding skin. If you palpate this breast, you will find the patient has um, quite a bit of tenderness and the mass is actually firm um, and quite um, large in many cases and well demarcated. It's somewhat irregular and uh, this patient did not have disease that was well advanced or it would be much more likely that they would have um, fistulous tracts developing as well. The clinical features are the typical features of inflammation and you can appreciate that they would have um, an irregular mass. It can be uh, as small as one centimeter but as large as uh, 20 centimeters and taking up most of the breast. I've shown you the erythema. Warmth is present when you palpate and um, there may be axillary lymphadenopathy as well. And this may um, give the clinician a concern for either infection or uh, uh, cancer as well. The patients may have podorange of the skin and they may have deformities of the nipple as well. Um, something that I used to um, think of was particularly a concern for cancer only. These are other photos just to show you the type of clinical features that the patient might have. The picture on the left is a patient who has been um, treated for some time um, with rather advanced disease and you can appreciate these fistulous tracts that have been um, cleaned up um, and there are several uh, from that area of the breast. Um, you can see um, in another patient in the middle, these large areas of open uh, skin wounds and a surrounding large area of erythema and breast mass. You can imagine this would be um, really very uh, emotionally difficult for the patient. As you can imagine that many of the patients will think that they have um, a breast cancer and they may either uh, seek medical attention because they are in, in uh, pain, but they may not seek medical attention because they are concerned that they will end up with a mastectomy. This is a, a photo on the right of a patient who has had a granulomatous lesion removed from the breast. And what I'd just like you to focus on is the irregularity of the mass and the idea that it was difficult to remove this without getting normal uh, breast tissue involved. That's probably a reason why um, breast surgery may not be the ideal, but is still um, an option for patients uh, who have uh, large areas of the breast involved. And you will also be interested to note that in some places, uh, mastectomy has been a, a fairly frequent um, treatment. How do we make a diagnosis of granulomatous mastitis? It's diagnosed by biopsy. Um, the disease shows non-necrotizing granulomas in combination with localized infiltrate. Uh, 
multinucleated giant cells, epithelioid histiocytes, lymphocytes, and plasma cells. In some patients, there is an organized sural microabscess occurring um, with some neutrophilic lymphocytes as well. Inflammation can uh, involve a small area of a single lobule or can involve several areas. And um, you can imagine that there is um, considerable tissue damage that occurs the longer this disease goes on without treatment. These are photos just to show you a core biopsy of a patient with a typical uh, granulomatous change uh, on biopsy. The far uh, left-hand side is a biopsy that shows um, H and E stain with granuloma formation. And you can see surrounding areas of uh, lymphocytes with the arrow showing this granulomatous change. The pathologist, of course, should look for other sources of pathology. Um, in B, uh, there has been uh, another stain trying to look for fungal lesion, the fungal organisms, and on the far right, AFB, which is part of our differential diagnosis in patients who could have uh, acid fast and tuberculous mastitis. These are other photomicrographs of the pathology, just so you can see it pretty clearly. Um, breast tissue with a granuloma, granuloma here, uh, histiocytes, plasma cells, um, lymphocytes surrounding this. Here are other um, pathology slides. You can see the surrounding fatty breast tissue and the presence of this granuloma in this magnified slide. And certainly it should be fairly easy to make a diagnosis and to exclude other infectious causes as the potential problem. Post biopsy, I will warn you that some patients will develop uh, fistulous tracts. This is a photo of a patient in whom the patient had uh, rather extensive breast involvement and following biopsy had three large areas which were wounds that were open and um, difficult to close. And with uh, treatment, although you can see that there is considerable abnormality in the breast, many of these scars will heal in or fill, fill in with fatty tissue. And um, it could, can be particularly distressing for the patient particularly when they have open wounds and areas of deformity. And I would um, imagine that these patients um, are really quite emotional at times. And we've seen that in some of our patients who have had this type of uh, granulomatous change with drainage from their biopsy. So I've mentioned that conventionally um, we use imaging for breast pathology to try and determine extent of disease where the pathology is involved, but we do not use a mammogram as a way to make a diagnosis of granulomatous mastitis. We use histology to confirm and hopefully an early diagnosis can be made. And the major point of course, is that malignancy should be excluded as a primary differential diagnosis, particularly those who have inflammatory um, tumors of the breast. Um, other involvement should con be considered, as I mentioned, tuberculosis or fungal involvement, but there are other patients who have uh, vasculitis, and I'd be remiss as a rheumatologist if I didn't add the polyangiitis with granulomatosis may present with breast lesions as well, as could sarcoidosis. These are a this is a table of clinical characteristics of patients with granulomatous mastitis versus those with tuberculous mastitis. Just to impress on you that although they may share some characteristics, including breast mass and breast pain, um, the patients who have tuberculous mastitis tend to be a little older with the patients of, in the age range of mean of 40 years versus 33 years for patients with granulomatous mastitis. Um, we think about tuberculosis, particularly in our uh, transient South Florida population, and it should be considered and stains should be made 
to at least evaluate the patients on their biopsy and to consider whether they are at increased risk for tuberculosis and tuberculous mastitis. When we think of granulomatous diseases of the breast, um, this slide gives you an idea of what sort of um, differential diagnosis is involved. On the far side, the infectious diseases, including bacterial and fungal. I haven't seen much, however, on parasitic infections of the breast. Um, foreign body, certainly we do see patients who have had silicone leakage and uh, foreign bodies related to silicone, uh, as well as tumors or fat necrosis for other reasons. Um, there are some patients who have autoimmune disorders, um, including uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and Sjogren's syndrome, who may present with breast lesions. And then in the category of unknown, um, we certainly have our, our rare but important category of granulomatous mastitis. Um, I, I would also be remiss as a rheumatologist if I didn't show you this slide. This is a uh, very nice Venn diagram to demonstrate to you some of the typical features that we see in patients with some types of vasculitis. Uh, granulomatous mastitis, lymphocytic infiltrates, and duct ectasia. And you can appreciate that some of the patients will have several of the uh, overlapping features. In addition, I was um, perhaps not as surprised to find that IgG4 related disease has been described in patients with um, breast lesions and should be part of our differential diagnosis as well. In terms of radiology, a mammogram can show variable features. Sometimes they look pretty normal. Sometimes there are quite discrete masses that need to be addressed. Um, there is often a symmetry of either a single part of the breast or several um, areas of that breast that has skin thickening or nipple retraction or axillary lymphadenopathy making the diagnosis in question. Um, Calcifications, however, are rare, and that may help you in making a particular diagnosis. A mammogram cannot distinguish invasive or inflammatory breast cancer from granulomatous mastitis. This is a photo just to show you a mammogram in a patient who has quite an obvious lesion uh, in the breast on the mammogram, and that should then lead to a biopsy. In terms of ultrasound, um, Oftentimes we will see um, hypoechoic uh, masses suggesting uh, there may be fluid present, there may be fistula and fistula tract present. And it's useful to document the uh, size of the uh, lesion as well um, as to monitor reactive lymph nodes, for example, but um, is not particularly helpful alone in making a diagnosis. These are photos to show you a lesion in a patient with granulomatous mastitis on ultrasound uh, with a nipple over in the far um, up, upper left corner and a granulomatous tract that you can see. Using MRI, um, we can certainly evaluate extent of disease and compare to the contralateral breast and these can be uh, used to monitor patients over time. And even in patients in whom I have had a diagnosis of granulomatous mastitis, um, many times we'll be asked to repeat a uh, MRI in the future to uh, diagnose that the, there is resolution of the mass and that there is no other disease present. There have been very occasional patients described with granulomatous mastitis and a cancer in the same area. And these are photos just to show you extensive disease in a patient with an MRI of the breasts. So radiology may be helpful. Um, and certainly uh, if there is any um, need for either ultrasound or MR, this can be easily um, reviewed with the radiologist and ordered. The radiographic features that I mentioned um, are patients who have the mass, who do not have um, necessarily any calcifications, but have an hypoechoic mass um, with sometimes tubular extensions. 
There is no consensus regarding treatment of patients with granulomatous mastitis. This is a slide which shows you on the left the medical treatments involved for these patients. And I was quite shocked to uh, 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 find that topical corticosteroids have been used as well as local injection of corticosteroids with some improvement in patients. I'm not sure that um, there are patients would use uh, topical corticosteroids sufficiently long enough or with enough up uptake to improve their disease. Oral corticosteroids have been and continue to be used for the treatment of granulomatous mastitis and methotrexate and other immunosuppressants certainly has uh, support. You might imagine that because rheumatologists are involved in the treatment of these patients, those patients who have failed to respond to other therapy um, have been treated and successfully with TNF inhibitors. Uh, biopsy is an important surgical uh, treatment. Excision um, may be done in patients with early disease. And as I said, extensive disease um, has been treated with mastectomy, but surgical treatment tends to be less of a uh, important therapy at this time. Um, there have been some attempts at comparing various corticosteroid therapies in patients with granulomatous mastitis, and uh, this is a report um, to indicate that patients had similar uh, response, whether they had systemic treatment or systemic and topical therapy um, as far as their improvement. Methotrexate monotherapy has been helpful in, in some patients who had failed to respond to either antibiotics, prednisone, or surgical intervention. We use it similarly to how we use patients, how we treat patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And um, the average dose of uh, methotrexate was in the range of 18 milligrams weekly for about 12 months. You can appreciate that these are photos of methotrexate monotherapy in a patient who has had a biopsy and still has active disease. And some months later, there's also filling in of the normal breast tissue as well as healing of the mass. The etiology remains to be determined and includes hormonal effects, infectious disease possibilities, which I was quite surprised about, autoimmune disorders and genetic predisposition. As far as hormonal, um, I put this in, of course, uh, for those of interest and particularly um, for our chief um, to indicate that increased levels of prolactin have been associated with the development of granulomatous mastitis, both in patients who had prolactin levels that were increased by drugs and those who had pituitary tumors. Um, there is a subgroup of patients with cystic neutrophilic mastitis with, in which the patients have a distinct histology. And this has been associated with Carinobacterium species. These patients may be treated with long-term antibiotic therapy. There have been various types of antibiotic therapy um, used. And in some parts of the world, it is a first line before they use either uh, corticosteroids or immunosuppressants. These are demographic uh, review of patients who had carinobacterium um, in various parts of the world, and um, some had associated uh, prolactin levels as well. So my teaching points are, although this is rare, the disease should be identified. It is diagnosed by biopsy. A typical patient is an obese 35-year-old Hispanic or Mediterranean uh, female sometimes with an elevated prolactin level, please rule out an infection or cancer um, or other immune-related underlying disease. The typical therapy is usually corticosteroid and or methotrexate, and often both is used, and consider pregnancy issues in which immunosuppressants may not be appropriate. I'll end with this slide that says, please learn from your patients, find a disease to explore, and common, uncommon, or rare, find the disease and exercise your brain. I'll stop at this time if you have any questions.
Thank you, Dr. Tozman. That was a great presentation and something I'm sure will appear as a board question at one point in our lives. So, uh, and I'm embarrassed to say, I must say, before your talk, I didn't know very much about it. So thank you very much. Because of the uh, time, we're already at the top of the hour. We'll have questions uh, in the chat. Whoever wants to remain can. I wish everyone a good and safe day. Don't forget to uh, get the CME and the MOC uh, credit at the uh, in the chat. You can see that. And again, thanks both our presenters for just an extraordinary job today at Grand Rounds. Everyone have a safe day and a great day. Thank you.